The OSIRIS-REx mission successfully returned its asteroid sample to Earth this week after a seven-year mission, bringing the total to three pristine asteroid samples that humans have fetched and returned from space. First to do so was JAXA's Hayabusa mission, which returned a minuscule amount of grains from the Itakawa asteroid in 2010. Then JAXA's Hayabusa 2 mission returned five grams of material from the asteroid Ryugu in 2020. And now OSIRIS-REx has returned from the much older asteroid Bennu, with over 60 grams of material from the asteroid that we can now study alongside the material that Hayabusa brought back to answer questions about how our solar system formed and where did the ingredients for life come from. Now, we've answered a lot of questions like that before by studying meteorites, so asteroids that have actually impacted with Earth, but we're limited to how much we can actually learn from them because as they fall through the atmosphere and impact with the Earth, they become contaminated. So there's always that little shadow of doubt that whatever you find from studying meteorites could actually just be something on Earth that's contaminated the sample. But actually going to an asteroid in space, collecting a sample there and bringing it back to Earth means we have these incredible unsullied rock samples that we can do tests on. So before we get to actually what tests NASA are going to do and what science questions are going to try and answer, let's start with a little quick recap on OSIRIS-REx. So the mission was launched on the 8th of September 2016 on an Atlas V rocket from Cape Canaveral in Florida in the USA. Lift off of Osiris and it arrived at Bennu a few years later in December 2018. Now, Bennu is an asteroid that's around about 490 meters wide, and it orbits the sun at a similar distance to Earth. It's in a class of near-Earth asteroids collectively called the Apollo Group, and it was actually only discovered in 1999. Now, after arriving at Bennu, OSIRIS-REx spent 500 days in orbit mapping the surface of the asteroid to decide which area to actually collect the sample of rock from, and then, of course, take a load of data on Bennu's size and its spin and its orbit around the sun whilst it was there. Now, after deciding which site to try and collect the sample from, OSIRIS-REx touched down on Bennu on the 20th of October 2020. It then let out a little puff of nitrogen gas and held out its robotic arm to collect as much material as possible that was thrown up in the cloud. At that point, the team at NASA estimated that it had collected around about 57 grams of material from the surface of Bennu. It then spent a couple more months in orbit around Bennu before being deorbited in May 2021 and starting its journey back to Earth. The sample then touched down at 8.42 local time on Sunday the 24th of September 2023 in the Utah desert after a 7.1 billion kilometer round trip. It was then taken to a temporary clean room where it was unpacked and then repacked to be sent to NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. Now, the folks at NASA have been preparing for this moment for years with many dress rehearsals of the return, the transport, and the unboxing of the sample, for want of a better word. All of this footage that I'm showing you here is from the dress rehearsal earlier this year. And they did all these dress rehearsals because they wanted to get everything right, because keeping the sample sterile at these stages is of the utmost importance. You know, they store it in pure nitrogen for the transport from the desert where it crash landed to Johnson Space Center in Texas. And of course, they also took samples of the soil and the air at the landing site, you know, collected just in case. It's then going to be stored in a sealed glove box, again, filled with nitrogen to keep it sterile. And the actual sample canisters themselves will not be opened until around about 10 days after the sample arrives at the Johnson Space Center. And that's just to give the team enough time to fully check those nitrogen glove boxes again to make sure that they are airtight and that sample remains completely sterile and free from any Earth contaminants. Now, if you're as excited as I am to see what these samples actually look like, that's going to happen around about Wednesday, the 11th of October. But that's when NASA have said that they will actually release the images they take once the samples have been opened to the public. Now, once it's opened, more than half of the sample is actually going to be put into storage, into the archive for future generations to do any scientific experiments they want to do on the rocks returned 
from Bennu in the same way that moon rocks from the Apollo missions were put into the archive as well, so that if any new scientific hypotheses arise and you need to test it with some asteroid sample from Bennu, then you can do that because you've still got a sample in storage. Some will be given to ESA and JAXA to compare to the Hayabusa samples from the asteroids Ryugu and Itakawa, in the same way that JAXA has already shared some of the Hayabusa return samples with NASA as well. And then the rest will start to get analyzed straight away. Now, if you're curious about the specific details of how the sample will be analyzed, then boy, do I have a 274 page document for you. It's been written by the OSIRIS-REx team and it outlines the 70 different hypotheses that they will test with the sample returned from Bennu. There is a giant flowchart with all the tests that will be done, including the amount of the sample used for each test down to the milligram, and a description of all the techniques that will be used in all these individual tests, including spectroscopy, for example, which allows you to work out, you know, what molecules and compounds the sample that you're looking at is made of. So in this case, what is the asteroid Bennu made of? Then you've got microscopy techniques to show the structure on small scales of the sample that's been returned. And then also spectrometry, which can tell you the ratio of isotopes in a sample, i.e. the amount of atoms of an element that have extra neutrons in their nucleus, which makes them heavier. So now measuring that ratio of the amount of normal atoms to the heavier isotopes is an incredibly useful thing to do because what it can tell you is things like where in the solar system an object formed, or if an object contains pre-solar material, i.e. material that was there before the sun formed, and then also how old an object is as well. So it's an incredibly useful technique, but it is one that you have to be careful with because a sample is completely destroyed in the process as it has to be dissolved in acid. So I'll link that document with all that detail in the video description below if you want some light bedtime reading. But I'm also going to pick out three of these hypotheses that we want to test with the sample from Bennu that's been returned by OSIRIS-REx. So let's start with testing whether this material from Bennu contains the ingredients for life. Now the team are not testing for life itself on Bennu, but instead are testing to see if they can find the ingredients for life that are actually thought to have been brought to Earth by impacts with asteroids in the early days of the solar system. Because asteroids are essentially relics left over from the formation of the solar system. They don't really have any atmospheric processes or geological processes that can destroy any of that evidence from a time before life began on Earth. So they really are fossils of what was happening at that time. Now from studying meteorites that have actually impacted with Earth, we know that asteroids contain things like proteins and amino acids, these ingredients that when you have the right conditions and the right chemistry are the building blocks for life. And so that has always supported this hypothesis that it was asteroids that brought these ingredients to Earth. But there's always been that slight shadow of a doubt there that actually what you are finding in the meteorites that have impacted Earth is just contaminants from Earth itself. So to be able to test whether this pristine sample from Bennu contains amino acids and proteins in it is something that astrobiologists are incredibly excited for, especially because the material that makes up Bennu is thought to be incredibly old, about 4.5 billion years old, right from the early days of the solar system. So this is definitely one where those spectroscopy and spectrometry techniques will shine. The second hypothesis that I wanted to highlight that the team will be testing is this idea that asteroids also brought water to the early Earth. Now, if you're a long-term subscriber of this channel, you will have heard me talk about this idea before because we don't know where Earth got its water from. And there's something in astrophysics called the snow line. Essentially, it's the distance from a star beyond which the temperature is low enough that you start to get ice forming. So that could be water ice, but it could also be methane ice or ammonia ice, for example. And what that means is that if you're then forming planets out at that distance a long way from the star, then you've got bits of rock that start to come together, but you've also got bits of ice in the mix as well that can go into forming those planets. But closer into the star, inside the snow line, the ice will just vaporize and you will form a planet with no water. 
Now, the snow line in the solar system is currently five times the Earth-Sun distance. Now, it was a bit closer in in the past because there was a lot more dust surrounding the sun while the planets were still forming, which cooled things down a little bit. And so that brought the snow line to 2.7-ish times the Earth-Sun distance, which is around about the asteroid belt area. So as far as we know, we think that while Earth was forming, there was no water in this part of the solar system. For Earth to get its water, it has to have been brought by asteroids and comets from beyond the snow line at the edge of the solar system to the inner solar system and then impact with the Earth and then the ice melts and you start to form oceans on Earth. Now to test that hypothesis, what you can do is compare the ratio of normal hydrogen to its isotope, heavy hydrogen, aka deuterium. And you can compare that ratio in the hydrogen that makes up water, H2O, in the asteroid sample from Bennu compared to on Earth. If this deuterium over hydrogen ratio, or D over H, is the same for both the sample from Bennu and on Earth, then you've got a lot more evidence to support the idea that the water on Earth comes from the same place as any water ice on Bennu, the far reaches of the solar system beyond the snow line, from which point Bennu migrated inwards to become a near-Earth asteroid. And then finally, the third hypothesis I wanted to highlight is the question of whether Bennu is a rubble pile. And the reason that this is like such a big idea that we want to test is because of how we think planets actually form. That you start with, you know, little specks of dust clumping together and then little grains and then huge clumps of rock clumping together under gravity. And then at a certain point, the pressure increases and the gravity becomes strong enough to fully round out an object. But for the smaller asteroids, that history of all that clumping together is still there. But in this model, you've got this added complication of the fact that as you start to get a larger and larger size, it's not quite managed to round itself out yet and is still just piles of rubble. If those two collide rather than clump, then you are going to actually have a big impact that sort of throws out all of that rubble and sort of breaks apart whatever baby planet you've actually managed to form. So the idea is that there must then be a re-clumping of all of those pieces back together. Now the hypothesis is that Bennu is exactly that, a pile of rubble held together under gravity. And the reason this hypothesis was raised is because of the very strange properties that Bennu has. It spins very strangely, for example, so it suggests there was an impact at some point in its history. Now again, we should be able to test this with the spectrometry, i.e. what the isotope ratio is, and the spectroscopy, what the sample is made of. Essentially to work out if the material that we've collected from the surface of Bennu has all formed at different depths in the original asteroid that had clumped together before it was broken apart and then clumped together again to form Bennu. And if we find that is the case, and we find evidence to support this hypothesis, it will really support our models of planet formation, which doesn't just have big impacts for the solar system, but also for any exoplanet systems around other stars. So that was just a little taste of what science is going to be done with the sample that's been returned by OSIRIS-REx from Bennu. And we didn't even touch on what's known as the Yarkovsky effect, which will be studied with data from when OSIRIS-REx was in orbit around Bennu. This is where radiation from the sun heating the surface of an asteroid can change its orbit around the sun, which as you can imagine is a huge deal when you're thinking about near-Earth asteroids and whether they actually like pose a threat and a danger to us here on Earth. So it's incredibly important that we understand the Yarkovsky effect in great detail and study it as much as we can. So let me know down in the comments if you want a, a whole video on the Yarkovsky effect. But for now, as usual, all we can do is just be patient while we wait for the samples to be transferred to Johnson Space Center and then the analysis can start and all these tests can be run. And then we can just look forward to when the results are going to be published in the next few years. But make no mistake when those results are published, I'm going to be covering them right here on this channel. So please make sure that you're subscribed so that you don't miss out. After arriving at Bennu, Osiris Sprex, Osiris Sprex, I knew this was going to get hard, Osiris Rex, Osiris Rex. <sighs> After deciding on which site to select the sample from, Osiris Rex then, we've had Osiris Rex, now we've had Osiris Rex. <laughs> Pick easier names, people. <laughs> and they did all these dress rehearsals because keeping the sample, sample? 
sample sterile. And then big chunks of rock until you start to form sort of a little baby planet. Baby planet, do 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 do. Baby planet, do 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 do. Baby Benu, do 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 do. Baby Benu. I, I mean, I've got that song in my head now. So I apologize to all of you who I have probably also got that song in your head. Sorry, not sorry. 